You know what? I can't take this anymore. I'll be right back. This is a terrible idea. Seriously, I don't even know why I'm making this video. No good can come from it. I, I guess it's just what's in my heart this week. Before we begin, I have two small statements. One, I enjoy both of these games and in fact currently run a Patreon Pathfinder 2e game and a Patreon Dungeons & Dragons 5e game back to back for two groups three out of every four weeks of the month. Yes, addition muddling is a real thing and I would like to think that running them back to back and seeing the different gaming experiences just a few hours apart has given me a fair insight to the strengths and weaknesses of these games compared to one another. Two, I'm going to be slightly more lenient in the comments this week, but that is not an excuse to, for being people to one another, okay? I will never understand people from nearly identical fandoms belittling one another. It's like, hello, the person you're insulting almost certainly has far more in common with you than other people in your life. Like, please, Please keep the discussion from devolving into just simple name calling. I'm begging you guys. Okay, so here's how this will work. I have reached out to a few friends and patrons and asked them to help me theorize the most important gaming mechanics that in some way or another is significant to the game's design and feel. After that, I took it a step further and narrowed down that list to 15 with the help of my younger brother, Daniel, who is the best dungeon master I've ever played with. And that includes Jim Davis of WebDM and my good friend Guy Sklanders from How To Be A Great GM. While my brother and I get along quite well, he gives exactly zero sh that I have a YouTube channel and will tell me to my face that I'm dumb or wrong. And so I feel like this, with his help, we have objectively narrowed down the most impactful mechanics between these two games to these 15. So now we are going to tackle them one by one. My opinions are subjective and I will award one point for each topic as we move through them. Okay, ready, set, go. Our first mechanic is one that I feel like is a no brainer and that is the death and dying mechanics. On one side, we have the death saves mechanic for 5e and on the other, we have the whole chaotic mess of Pathfinder 2e's dying one, but you get healed and come back up with the wounded two, then you drop again and start at dying three. So naturally, the point here goes to Pathfinder 2e. Uh, yeah, here's what I will say. The way that this is presented in the core rulebook is a total mess. However, when you are running it in game, it's actually super simple and easy. And it also has the added bonuses that unlike 5e, you cannot simply be healing worded back up 10 straight times without consequence. And rolling a natural 20 doesn't miraculously bring you up to one hit point at the start of your turn, AKA, I stand up miraculously and attack your face again. Pathfinder takes an early lead with honestly a solidly designed game mechanic that probably could have been presented a little cleaner. For mechanic number two, we have action economy in combat with D&D's move action, standard action, and sometimes bonus action versus Pathfinder 2E straightforward three actions. Out of all the mechanics we're going to talk about, few will be an easier choice than this, and the point is resoundingly awarded to Pathfinder 2E. Uh, I don't think this is subjective in the least. What we have been presented in Pathfinder 2e is simply incredible and super easy to understand. You just get three actions, do whatever you want to with them. Uh, want to move, attack, move, go for it. Want to attack, attack, move, or move, interact with an object, attack, whatever, just go for it. Meanwhile, trying to explain to a new player in 5e that even though they cast Misty Step as a bonus action, they didn't use their move action at all, they can't attack with their offhand dagger after their short sword because technically that's also a bonus action and you can't trade a bonus action for a move or a standard action is frustrating for you as a DM who understands the rules and it's frustrating for a player who finds those things illogical. And talking about spell casting action economy for Pathfinder, this has been one of my absolute favorite changes to the game, hands down. By giving players the tactical choice with flexible spells and how many actions they want to spend casting them, totally, totally genius. So if a player wants to cast a magic missile with one action, they fire off one dart. If they want to use two actions, then, then do something else, they get two darts. And if they want to stand still in the back with good positioning, they can use all three actions and get all three darts. Point Pathfinder by a landslide. 
However, things are not perfect for Pathfinder as we move on to game mechanic number three, which I'm going to just call spell slots and spell casting. If you can't guess, this is where 5e really shines as it's going to take the point here. Pathfinder's spontaneous and heightened rules are an absolute mess, way overcomplicated and truly humorously bad when you try to decipher them. It's like, all I want to do is like maybe cast this fireball at a higher level and then you and your group will spend the next 15 minutes trying to figure out if it's even possible and how exactly that's done for your sorcerer. Meanwhile, where Pathfinder fails, D&D doesn't just succeed, but is a smashing success of design. Not only is their system easy to understand as a player or coach as a DM, but it's easy to adapt on the fly for a DM running a monster with spell casting as well. I mean, does my Flame Skull want to forgo a level two spell slot to throw a magic missile at level two? Done. Super simple. Point, hands down, Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Game mechanic number four might be our most controversial one, and that is the proficiency bonus. On one side, we have 5e with flat proficiency bonuses, and on the other side, we have Pathfinder 2e with their expert, trained, untrained master, but it grows every level, if and only if you've at least trained. It's just a total mess. Okay. I might be being a little harsh on it. The system isn't that complicated to understand, and it does lend itself to game mechanics that I, I actually like that we'll talk about later, but compared to 5e, it's just all over the place. And even if you know it by heart and love it, every time you level, you've got so many skills to change the modifiers on, and depending on your BTT, if you're playing online, like many of you now, uh, you've got to reset a lot of shortcuts and hotbars. Fifth edition takes the point. Our fifth game mechanic is one that, again, is pretty lopsided, and that's multi-classing. I cannot overstate how beautifully elegant Pathfinder 2nd Edition is with multi-classing. Holy crap, turning multi-classing from the disaster that previous games had it into a simple pool of feats was brilliant. Hey, you want your fighter to be a little more like a ranger? No problem, just start taking a few of these specially designated feats that will give your character similar, if not identical features that the ranger's base class have. No need to wait for your character to hit the exact perfect right level so they don't miss their ability increase at level four or spell slot at level seven or their extra attack at level five so you don't fall behind. Just start acting slightly more like a fighter ranger. Conversely, I dare say that what Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition does, in fact, discourages players from trying to multi-class too much lest they become overpowered. Point, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Game mechanic number six <laughs> is a big one as we look at the different ways the games look at skills and skill checks. Oh boy. To be honest, neither are perfect systems in my opinion, but there is one that I far and away prefer after running them over and over, and that's 5e. I have to be honest, there are few things that hurt my soul as bad as getting Pathfinder 2 in my hands and seeing the just absurd amount of crunch in this section of the core rulebook. Genuinely, everything that I love about how incredible Pathfinder's combat is versus 5th edition takes a complete 180 with running a game outside of combat. With Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, I can just make a call and stay in the moment. There's a gap up ahead in the trail. Do I think I could jump it? Probably. Well, how far is it? I don't know, probably 10 to 12 feet across. But the other side is just slightly lower. Okay, I'll try to jump it. No problem, give me a strength check. Can I add my athletics? Sure, if you're proficient. Okay, 16, is that enough? You take a few steps and leap the gap, but you realize your gear is weighing you down a little more than you thought. You slam onto your stomach on the other side, but luckily, you're able to grab on enough and heave the rest of your body up onto the stone pathway. Simple, easy. They trust Dungeon Masters enough to just run the game. Meanwhile, Pathfinder 2e, oh boy, articulates absolutely everything to their detriment. Looking at a similar situation, when the player asks for the distance, you would have to commit to an exact distance across. Then, unless you can memorize the difference in the rules on page 242 in the middle of a 638 page rule book, by the way, for a long jump and make sure that you're not accidentally mixing it up with high jump, because there are in fact separate rules for them, you would almost certainly have to stop your game and look it up. 
I just don't know what they were thinking here. I have no idea why they really thought that roughly six paragraphs were needed to describe in full detail the exact mechanical difference between a character who wants to make a long jump versus the exact mechanical difference of a character making a high jump. Oh, it hurts my soul, I tell you. It hurts my soul to read that. Point, D&D 5e. Ah, speaking of which, game mechanic, I'm sorry. Game mechanic number seven is the only thing on this list that isn't purely a game mechanic, and that's editing. Now, I know this may seem weird, and honestly, what I'm about to say may just hurt a few feelings out there in the tabletop world, but it's how I feel, and so I'm gonna be critical. For as much grief as people gave Dungeons & Dragons 5e for their player's handbook layout, I have never seen a game as poorly edited as Pathfinder 2nd Edition, ever. Uh, in fact, I believe that Pathfinder 2e would be a far more approachable game and more popular if the designers cut at minimum 20% of it. 638 pages in a core rulebook is a problem. But their issue isn't just with not being able to cut their book down. I do not feel as though they understood their game from a consumer standpoint. They gave us a behemoth of rules. You know what? Okay, fine. But to not have the presence of mind to understand that if you're going to give gamers a 638 page core rulebook, then it better be damned easy to look stuff up in is mind boggling to me because nothing in this book is easy to find, nothing. <sighs> just for kicks, when I was scripting this video, I just like Googled Pathfinder 2e bad editing and clicked on the first link that came up. Here's a Reddit quote from someone in the first thread. The core rulebook layout with rules spread in multiple sections. Quote, oh, you want to craft? Maybe the rules are under skills or under a specific feat or in the player downtime action section. Maybe it's in the GM downtime rule section. Nope, just kidding. It's under earning an income, end quote. Uh, let me say that I feel your pain and this is far from the only example. Point, D&D 5e. But let's stay in a similar vein here with mechanic number eight, monster stat blocks. Again, I'm using mechanic a little loosely. On one side, we have 5e, which painfully lists out every single detail in their stat blocks over and over again. A great example of which is the clay golem listing out exactly what magic weapon does and exactly what magic resistance does. Then on page 169 of the monster manual, they do it again for the flash golem, spelling out exactly what each of those abilities does for that block. But you know what? I actually like this. I like this a lot. If I'm running a monster, I just look down and I read the stat block right then and there. And on the other side, we have Pathfinder 2e with its bounty of traits you are expected to memorize or look up if you don't have them memorized. A fantastic example that had me pulling my hair out in the middle of combat is the gelatinous cube on page 254 in the best area with its engulf ability. Okay, I have to pause. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I actually scripted this a few days ago when I had hair and reading it just now kind of <laughs> Okay, 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 engulf ability. Uh, it literally just says DC 19. Like, how lazy is it that they couldn't include reflex saving throw DC 19? So I think that it's a reflex saving throw. I, I'll just make the ruling. Okay, it, now it says rupture seven. What does rupture seven mean? It doesn't have anything else, just Rupture seven, and then more information about a saving throw against paralysis. Not even a fourth save against paralysis, by the way. Okay, let me check the bestiary index. Okay, no index in the bestiary. Maybe there's a glossary right before it. Nope, just creatures by CR. Maybe in front of that. Nope, that's creatures by type. Okay, surely it's in the 638 page core rulebook index. Nope, nothing. Okay, I'll just Google it right now. The sorcerer is casting a spell. I'm trying to stay in the moment. Okay, Archives of Nethys is the first result, their new SRD page, and it says nothing in the first result that's useful. But it lists a page in the best area of 342. I'll go back and check there. Okay, there is an ability glossary. I was close the first time. Ah, here it is, engulf. Two paragraphs later, I see one line about the term rupture. Ah! Point, Dungeons and Dragons, fifth edition. I don't care how similar that was to their last point, they get another one, okay? They get another point. Mechanic number nine, resting. So which is the better mechanic? Short rest where you miraculously heal in an hour with hit die followed by long rest that miraculously heal you back 83 hit points to full even if in the previous day you had been axed in the face by an Etten or Pathfinder 2e with no short rest and healing for con mod multiplied by your level once per day. Point, 
Pathfinder 2nd Edition. 5e Wrestling is so lame, they tried to retcon it with Meat Grinder mode, which also failed. Let's be honest, pacing yourselves in a dungeon or an enemy territory is meaningless in 5e. Meanwhile, Pathfinder system for wrestling feels actually right. Well done, Pathfinder. Mechanic number 10 for some will be the biggest deciding factor, and it probably deserves more than just a single point being awarded to it, and that's character design. I want to give Dungeons & Dragons 5e the props that they deserve for their emphasis on character creation with backgrounds. It was awesome to see. However, this, my dear friends, was never close. Pathfinder 2e takes this point by an absolute landslide. In fact, it's easily the single largest selling point for the game, in my opinion. It doesn't matter what kind of character you want to play in Pathfinder, you can make it. And even if a fellow party member had a similar idea, there's so much customization available to players that you could easily fill miles difference. This is the thing that Pathfinder does not just well, but excellent. Meanwhile, if you've seen one 5e Barbarian, you've seen them all. If you've seen one Warlock cast Eldritch Blast, you've seen them all. And let me get ahead of the comments that will say, well, 5e is about the character and not the stat sheet. Okay, fine, but those aren't mutually exclusive. If you can write a killer backstory for a 5e character, you can write a killer backstory for a Pathfinder 2e character. The only difference is the Pathfinder 2e character might play with a dazzling unique playstyle that you've never seen before based on how the character's mechanics were built. Point, Pathfinder. Mechanic number 10 is gear and magic item design. I am not going to pick on Dungeons and Dragons 5e for its de-emphasis of magic items. I get it, 3.5 and 4e were video games in terms of gear slots. However, I find that players love magic items. They love them. And having them find magic items lying around is just fun for me as a game master. I think Pathfinder 2e handles magic items and especially their mundane items spectacularly. There are so many good options even for mundane items and your players shouldn't feel forced in the slightest if they want something a little cooler to use. I don't think 5e has nearly as many good alternatives to their go-to best in slot weapons to snag a video game term. I could expand on this a little bit more but for brevity's sake, point Pathfinder 2e. Game mechanic number 12 is as meat and potatoes as you're going to get with the advantage-disadvantage system versus number crunching modifiers. I've had a few criticisms of advantage and disadvantage here on the channel, but my criticism is not with the mechanic itself, but rather the concept that everything in the entire game is advantage-disadvantage, except for cover and like two other examples. But with that said, it would be completely disingenuous of me to award this point to Pathfinder because let's face it, D&D 5e's advantage and disadvantage system rocks. It was simply innovative bringing it to the D20 system. I think they brought it here. Uh, without a doubt, this was and is the better game design. Now, I would still prefer a softer mix of the two systems and my flanking house rule in D&D 5e with plus two with adjacent squares receiving a plus one has been a smashing success with my players. But nevertheless, point to Dungeons and Dragons here. Oh man, mechanic number 13 is another huge one, and that is feats. On one hand, we have the awful memories that feat trees brought us, and thus D&D 5e now officially lists feats as an optional mechanic in an attempt to reduce players feeling forced to optimize and base their entire characters around said feats. On the other hand, we have Pathfinder 2e's newer, and in my humble opinion, significantly improved feat pool system. So who gets the point? Pathfinder 2e, which for any players out there who have genuinely played both games, I think you guys would agree with me hands down. Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, I feel, has not just de-emphasized feats in their games, but they've actually done a subpar job with them. I don't have any problems with their design approach being, hey, feats got way out of hand in other uh, in past editions. We want this game to have an easier barrier to entry, and so we are just not going to make feats a big part of the game. But the feats are so wildly unbalanced that they quite literally created exactly what they wanted to avoid, a meta. If you don't believe me, ask yourself, how many times have you seen a character take the Sentinel or Lucky feat? Then ask yourself how many times you've seen someone take moderately armored or weapon master. Worse yet, if you want a feat, you must forego an ASI. I mean, can you imagine wanting to just use a different weapon, 
efficient, efficiently because it's cool and it fits your character theme and background a little better with Weapon Master. And having to give up a plus two boost to Constitution just to do that? Terrible. And I don't even want to see comments about how feats are optional. Okay, I know that. It changes exactly nothing about this video. First, everyone uses feats, even Adventures League. And secondly, that's exactly the point. Wizards of the Coast put such little design and balance into their feats that they just said, ah, let's just tell people they're optional and call it a day. Meanwhile, Paizo's approach to feats being an integral part of their game, while at the same time eliminating the mountains of feat trees, feels so, so good. One of my biggest complaints about Pathfinder 1st Edition was that I felt like I literally had to stop and plan out every feat at level 1. I spent hours and hours theorizing the right build, and I know based on the forums that I'm not even kind of the only one to do that. But the feat pools make everything seem so natural and easy for the players. Hey, you're a goblin. At level one, you get a racial feat. Pick one of these four and your character gets something cool to differentiate them from other goblins. Hey, you just leveled up. You get a new feat of your choice from these eight. Hey, you leveled up again. You get another feat, but we added another four feats to your choices. Point Pathfinder 2e, the way that they handle feats for the players is like the reason to play the system. Is it perfect? No. Very good? I think so. Better than the 5e team? Absolutely. All right, now we're in the home stretch with mechanic number 14, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition with their Opportunity Attack versus Pathfinder 2nd Edition's Attack of Opportunity. I'm going to speak candidly here and tell you guys that I'm giving the point to the game that I prefer the least. Yes, that's right. I am admitting that I have a bias here and that the game mechanic that I like best isn't the better design. Basically, between a patron and my brother, they convinced me that I was wrong. And so I'm awarding the point here to 5th edition. Now, I will stand by the fact that the way Pathfinder 2e handles attacks of opportunity is actually superior for me, but there is no denying that after being a dungeon master for brand new players in both 5e and in Pathfinder 2e, 2e feels like it punishes the players more and 5e is just way easier to teach them. The best analogy I can come up with is it's sort of like Minecraft creative versus survival. Or, or wait, maybe it's like Dark Souls versus Mario Odyssey. Or maybe it's like Darkest Dungeon versus Pokemon. I don't know. Pick your favorite analogy, whatever. All I know is that I enjoy the nuance of Pathfinder 2e system, but when playing 2e, I've seen the frustration on my players' faces when they play loose with their spells and movements and then feel like they can't do the things they want to sometimes and have to wait for another round. And so, that brings us to our 15th and final game mechanic, Criticals. Now, when comparing D20 systems over the years to one another, normally, this wouldn't have even varied from one game to the next. And that's why I am including it here because Pathfinder 2e brought something totally different to the table with their plus 10, minus 10 crit system, which differs drastically from 3.5, Pathfinder 1st Edition, and 5th Edition. When I first read this in the core rulebook, I will admit I was skeptical. I immediately had flashbacks from Star Wars Edge of the Empire from Fantasy Flight Games, a system that I still think is overly taxing on the Game Master. But after running this for some time now, I have to say it's excellent. I thought it was going to be a lot tougher to keep track of, and maybe that's true for 100% analog players. But as I run 100% of my games at the moment in Fantasy Grounds, and have for quite some time, which immediately spits out whether a save is a critical success, a success, a failure, or a critical failure, this system is a winner. I love the concept that every roll matters to the extreme. Instead of the bugbear just failing their save against your fireball, they actually critically failed and now they take double damage. Instead of just rolling really high against the measly orc, you beat their AC by 10, so enjoy your crit. It's just satisfying and my players seem to love it every bit as I do. Meanwhile, 5e has a pretty solid crit system. I love that they took out critical restrictions against undead from older systems, and all in all, I think there is nothing wrong with the way that 5e handles criticals. It's clean and straightforward. And did I mention it's super easy to teach? Because it is. But I have to pick a winner here, and so the final point goes to Pathfinder. The game just has a better critical mechanic, and while it is slightly more complicated than 5e, I think it's every bit as inventive to what a critical should be as to what 5e brought to the table with advantage and disadvantage from modifiers, and I think that's saying something. 
So if my count is correct, that leads us to our overall winner in this head-to-head -head match, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Yeah! Congratulations, Pathfinder, yeah. you've won nothing. But you know, good job. Okay, okay, in all seriousness, this was a fun video to make, and the point was that both games bring a lot of great things to the table. If you ask me and my honest opinion as to why Pathfinder 2e, while being the number two highest selling game, with Starfinder as number three, by the way, isn't as popular as 5e, I'd probably say because of marketing, because of fear of missing out, because of nostalgia, and well, because 5e is also a very good game. Now, I'll go ahead and answer this right now because I know that I'm going to get asked, what game would I personally play or recommend? The short answer is both. And I know that that's lame, but truth be told, I would much rather play Pathfinder 2e than Dungeons and Dragons 5e. But, and this is a big, big but, I would much rather run a game of D&D 5e, and that kind of sucks to admit, but I cannot overstate how horrendously Pathfinder 2e is laid out for Game Masters. I mean, it it will outright stop your games from time to time, and I just, I hate that. But on the flip side, oh man, I love the combat and character creation so much in Pathfinder 2e compared to 5th edition. I'd much rather play in a Pathfinder campaign with a great GM than D&D, and I think that that says a lot about the game's design. It truly does have a lot to offer as far as game design goes. Now, I want to pass it over to you guys in the community. Let me hear it in the argument section, where did I get it wrong? What game mechanics did I not cover that you guys think are important and should have been covered? Which game do you prefer and have you honestly given the other an unbiased chance? Let us know down below. Now, I of course wanna give an absolutely massive thank you to my incredibly amazing patron community over at welcomeadventures.com. Guys, it's because of you that I can keep doing this. So I just want to say thank you. I appreciate it. My wife appreciates it. My child appreciates it. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, it means a lot to us. Uh, if you guys like what I do here and you want to support more content like this, welcomeadventures.com is a great way to do that and snag some rewards for yourself. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games as much as I do, I would love to have you subscribe every week mostly. I put out videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit the subscribe button down below and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody, and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.